Okay, great. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invite to come to Map Mapping Festival and to this special um, gathering. I was really glad to be able to be here yesterday too, and there's been some fantastic input. So thanks to Carmen and the Mapping Festival. So, And I hope what I'm going to add today, um, well, I think it is quite a good follow-on from the two sessions this morning. So, um, so I'm going to talk about future love and what I call the Internet of Bodies, which is my kind of futuristic view of where I think we should be going to, with some questions around it too. Um, so just quickly to tell you about myself a little bit. Um, my name's Guylaine, and I actually um, am creative director for a long-term collective called Body Data Space, previously called Shinkansen. And we are a very loose, fluid collective based in East London, but with members actually in different parts of the world. Um, I also work into um, the university system as a researcher, and I do BBC Click Radio, um, the show on Tuesday, every other Tuesday I do, um, on BBC World Service, which is a technology show. And I do also, in the context of the London scene, work into the creative industry sector and actually bridge into the business sector as the creative tech area becomes more and more interesting for the business sector too. So, Body Data Space um, is actually a, a wide group of people, very wide ranging in age, culture, background, mainly coming from um, um, performing arts base, but many of us are coming through virtual worlds, through um, interactive platform work, sound art. I myself come from a dance background, and I think that's important for this context today. And we deal with body and data in virtual physical space. And our premise really from the beginning, and I started work in this area as a dancer working with technologies from late 80s, early 90s, um, is actually putting a body at the center of the digital interaction we're dealing with. So we tend to look at the body as the interface itself. And so we're looking at the collaboration, the connectivity, and the enhancement of the body. So we work to blend and converge, and our focus is on live presence, telepresence, virtual presence, and we look at representation of the body too, for avatars and robotics. And of course, we look at wearable computing and all the developments in motion sense and gesture tech. And as I've mentioned, very much focusing on our living emotional bodies as the interaction canvas itself, and actually how that works in today's world. And today I'm going to talk to you a bit about our work, but in a lead up to talking about a vision of what we call collaborative share space and how we've been trying to engage in experiments in that area, which are about intimacy and about love and about a much more positive virtual physical blended experience. This is our mission statement. This is a set of words that we've been working with for years. Um, they're all words which relate to the body, to actually our emotions or our emotion, emotions or our emotions. They actually today, interestingly, are all used in relationship to our new digital technology and the effects that we have with it. So um, we're going to concentrate a lot on participate and create today, but most of these words and many more you will see are shifting in use across from the body to technology and back again. So Body Database, we started in 2004, and we've done a lot of projects, and previously in Shinkansen, right back in time, looking at this virtual physical blending. And we are creating work ourselves, quite large-scale commissions, but we also do curations, debates, forums, and we commission new works too. So I'm going to show you a quick range of those so that you can see where we're coming from into these ideas about future love. So telepresence has been my main area. As somebody that came from the dance sector, I actually, in the early 90s, started to work on connecting stages, thinking about how we represent ourselves through digital video, actually, was my first input, and what that does with our digital identity, and how we actually can make those connections, working at EU projects across Europe and across the world. So linking up through video and screens, dancers in different places entirely, working from London to Helsinki, London to Kyoto, London to Paris, sometimes with three stages, some really theatre experiences, but many actually with youth clubs into um, the club, club scene in London, um, crossing over lots of people, creating what we called telepresent zones. And in this, very much trying to look at the connection of the body, looking at virtual touch and trying to explore intimacy and the development of a more intuitive interface through the screen, uh, 
but as real time living humans, yeah. Now this work took us through many, many iterations. This is a project called Skin Touch Feel that we did in layers, putting skin upon skin upon skin, trying to get the visceral, the haptic into these, which are screen-based pieces, of course, yeah. And actually looking at the, the experience of telepresence, the development of um, navigation and orientation techniques when you're full-bodied in telepresence and how you relate to the others and how you connect. In the early days, we were dealing with lag, so a lot of these things around intimacy and touch were complex, but we were kind of determined to try and get there. We dealt with it through it. And of course, when Skype started, it was quite a big relief because everyone understood what we were up to. And today, I think we're in a society, those that have the use of, of Skype um, uh, across the world, where people are much more teleintuitive, and the younger generations, of course, are very at ease in relating to each other real time through screens, through the image of each other from different places in the world. So we had great fun doing all this work, particularly actually doing it in the club scene, which was really buzzy, linking up clubs across the world. But now to move forward a bit, um, what I'm going to talk about is our thinking around what we call hyper-enhanced sensuality. So looking at that virtual physical future of our senses. Now in the 90s, um, in the performing arts world, a lot of the discussion around technology and the technologies of the body were, was discussed in a fairly negative way. It was seen as something which was a disembodying situation. And that it must be something to be quite scared of because it would actually get rid of the need for live performance. Now, this discussion also happened in the music sector in detail, actually. We've seen all that coming through in press and into the commercial music sector, too. But, of course, as we're all aware, in fact, in the music sector and in performing arts, it's actually been exactly the opposite. There's more live concerts and live performances happening than ever before. There's lots of live meetups like we have today, which are equally being streamed as today. So we've got this virtual physical blending happening in different spaces. But the hypersensory body is actually a really important um, concept. If we look at the data that we today actually do release from our bodies through various wearables, through even your phone that most of you have got in this room now, yes, we have audio and visual, but equally we're dealing with touch, we're dealing with breath, proximity is there in your phones, and you've got um, a variety of different situations like, for example, eye recognition used at passport situations. Um, we've got, obviously, our voice, text, and SMEs, and more and more touch-based scenarios. On the, on the, um, on the left-hand side of the screen, smell, taste, tactile, touch, haptic, these are all things which, as you probably know, are being experimented with by pioneers at the moment. I think there's just been um, recently an output of virtual lemonade, so as you can taste the lemonade coming through. Um, a lot of work happening on taste and smell, but also the haptic, the tactile, that has started to become very much part of our consciousness in relationship to the data that comes from us, is released from us, and can be collected and used and brought back to us in different ways. So when, for example, we move, we can create an image um, in various scenarios. So that's the hypersensory body. The hypersensory body, it's always on. Um, it's, it's not always on, we can turn it off. We can turn our wearables off, we can turn our phones off. Um, it's not the same as liveness, and that's where we'll come to in a bit. For a variety of projects that we've done, trying to explore this hypersensory side, um, from quite early on in the 90s, this is um, a piece done by Foam from Belgium, looking at immersion of the whole body in motion-sensitive environments in a big circus arena, actually, wonderful. And this is a biofeedback project um, by Tekla Schripost and Susan Kazell, um, looking at personal visualization and sonification, coming from heartbeat and breath, and then actually connecting it to each other. Here, the three of them are creating a joint sonific sound and visual output. So this was from around 2002. It was a commission we did as part of a program called Future Physical, which looked at some of these issues in the early 2000s. And again, looking at digital intimacy. This is a piece we did for the Connecticut Art Fair called Dare We Do It Real Time, looking at the, the actual whole thing of using real-time body data in staged or, or um, performative scenarios. Some of it working, some of it not. Some of it fake, some of it real. Here, Sasha's dancing real-time with an avatar who has actually been manipulated real-time by the avatar creator, Ivo Diossi. 
We've also been looking at synesthesia, so senses that we don't actually you know, pin down in our, our, our knowledge of the five senses, where actually there's probably about 32 senses that we deal with from our bodies, and that's going up as we find out more. Is anybody in the room synesthetic? Does anyone here have synesthesia? When you hear sound, you see color. When you get touch, you see sound. This double sense thing. So usually someone does in the audience. So, and synesthesia is a growing awareness on this. It's a, well worth looking up. There's a lot of people around the world looking at these double senses, these things that come together in different people. This is a piece by a choreographer, um, Shisata Minamanura, that we, can, we um, created and produced for her. Where she's a deaf choreographer and she wanted to see sound. And this is for, for a mixed audience of deaf, partially deaf, and hearing audience approaching that. Now, in Body Data Space, we've been talking what we call about collaborative share space. And this is a, a phrase that we use between us. It's actually that space that goes between us and others, where we put our data into the middle and where others put their data into the middle and we choose to share or not, depending. You've got your choices to share with friends, share with everybody, share anonymously, or just keep it for yourself or a close group. And we all know these spaces. We've been talking about them for the whole of the two days. They include all of the um, social media networks, uh, but they also include virtual worlds and gaming, performances which are using technologies, live streams like we're doing now, and installations. And it's this cl collaborative share space, and actually the bottom of this slide is hidden by the settee, where we um, must participate if we're going to understand this world. So what I always say is it's not a place for flaneurs. It's actually, you can't just stand on the edge and observe this. You've got to get in there and share it. And we know from some of the inputs today and yesterday, there's still a long way to go in this area of collaborative share space. And what we're interested in, in this collaborative share space, is actually how we start to move fully with our virtual and physical bodies into this, using distributed content with its multi-access points that come into it, these complex layers of interaction between ourselves as creators and users and others as creators and users in there, and the multiple data outputs that come from that and how we're going to see that expand in the future. So I'm going to show you a couple of projects we've done in the last few years which have been simple basically trying to get to a point of creating collaborative share spaces using our full real-time bodies. The first is a piece that we made um, called Me and My Shadow. This was created as part of an EU project and we actually did our part of it in the National Theatre in London. It actually converged a large virtual world, a sim, human gestures, motion capture and full body telepresence. And I'm going to show you a short film on that. So. As you can see, this is a box project. You go into a, a black box. You go in with nothing on you to, at all. Totally free, natural body. And we had four boxes. One in Paris, one in Istanbul, one in Brussels, and one in London. And the virtual world hang, hung between them. As soon as you entered, you became an avatar. And each different country, you were a different color avatar, actually. And you could interact with each other within this share space. And we had um, a... About 9,000 people went through over a couple of weeks. And here, we were very much looking at that interesting future point, and this is a quote from Bill Thompson, who does BBC stuff, looking at the real and the virtual and the blending of that and how that is moving, that, that blurred edge between the virtual and the physical, and particularly looking at the full natural body within that. And so sometimes you're in the virtual space, sometimes you're in the real world. And actually, can you tell the difference anymore? So our vision is of a future where perhaps you don't tell a difference anymore, but where it is actually working and complementary for our bodies. 
This is a tweet that happened from um, the London end. Um, uh, his mum was in Paris, and they actually very cleverly made time to go in at the same time into the share space and meet each other in there. We gave very simple instructions in that share space, and that was very much just to try and meet another avatar and have a hug. Actually, pretty much impossible, because we were working with very simple scenarios here, but it created some wonderful flows of people through the space finding each other. Now, collaborative share spaces, as I call them, and all of these spaces where we are sharing together data in different times, have got very serious issues. And in the next decade, I think really is about how we start to deal with the natural human needs for mobility and immersion. We look at it at the moment, we have our mobiles, we can share what's on them with perhaps two or three friends, but actually, in majority, immersive experiences are fixed. They're fixed within theatres or within domes, buildings that are not mobile. We have got some mobile domes moving around the world, and there's a lot more of these projected 210 degrees scenarios, but mobility and immersion is still a problem in this uh, area as is the virtual physical presence side. What is presence in this? And as we know, the virtual reality world is just starting to talk about the issue of presence, and I'll come back to that. And here again, looking at intimacy, sensuality, and liveness is still not sorted. And we're trying our best on this, and I wanted to talk a little about VR, the tool of today, but the VR headset, it is an immersive tool. We go in, we're fully immersed in, a, in amazing worlds, and we have full body physical reactions. When you walk off a cliff in virtual reality, you feel it in your body, in your stomach. You've probably all had these types of experiences. Yet, is it mobile? Well, you can take your headset with you and plug it in anywhere. And is it disembodying? Yes, we know it is. We've all seen the pictures of people in virtual reality in the same room, actually physically very unaware of each other, even though they may well be avatars together in that virtual world. Now, this is not new ideas. You've probably all seen this, um, this picture going around on Twitter and on the internet. Um, Hugo Gernsback, actually the first man to publish a sci-fi um, uh, magazine, actually, very ahead of his time, um, with his TV glasses here, I think, in 63. And equally, today, young people working with VR and pushing the edges of it. This is a um, British um, Egyptian artist called Mark Farid, who's doing 27 days in VR, fully in VR. He will have the headset on him day and night. Here he's learning to sleep with it on, to eat with it. And he will be actually receiving a stream of another person's life during that time. So there's a lot of testing going on on this project at the moment. But my premise really on this is that we're just not going to be doing this. That this particular technology is not the solution for our immersion scenarios. So um, we know we're not going to put our babies into headsets straight away. So we do know that VR is an incredibly useful tool, for particularly in areas of personal training, personal health and well-being. I think there's some amazing stuff coming out in that area. Meditation. Um, we know it's very useful for connecting people, but it's not the final one. And I think we're in a decade of shift across this. So recently, last year, we created a, a piece called Collective Reality, where we actually really focused on the whole concept of experiencing togetherness. And this is a sensory environment which actually responds to our interaction with others. So the more you're working physically with the others, the bigger the response is. And this was created for a large festival in London called Future Fest. And here's a few pictures of it. It was a large scale piece. Um, we had layers of people moving in different ways in it. As they moved around together, as they hugged, as they came together in groups, aided by some of the um, artists working with them, um, they actually did have um, some fun experiences. These are also performers working into that space with the interactivity. We had freestyle footballers, hip-hop artists, burlesque art dancers, contact improvisation. Um, there's a little bit of film here, a bit fuzzy. But moving around together, enjoying the interaction that happens into generative, sound, audiovisual, large-scale projected space. So, Collective Reality actually is, um, this is a little plug, going to um, Montreal next week. We're going to be in the Dome. There's a very beautiful dome in Montreal where they're doing a lot of work with digital immersion. It's a 210 degree dome, so it goes below the horizon, so you actually can even lie on the floor and the horizon's around you. And it's at SAT in Montreal where they do a 
um, Immersion Experience Symposium every year, and this year the focus is on the embodied, embodiment and embodied spaces. So there will be lots of VR people there and lots of people working with digital immersion. So. The other area that we've been really looking at in our commissioning, in our work, is what we call synthetic emotions. So that whole thing of the love of others who are robotic and virtual, and of the multi-identities out there. Now, some of you may well be aware of this, but there's a lot of love and romance happening in virtual worlds, and there's a, obviously we're on our way to discussing this in a much bigger way. We did a project, an EU project, again, a few years ago called Robots and Avatars, which was very much exploring how young people will work and play with new representations and forms of, of themselves in the future, and looking at that virtual, physical, blended life 15 years ahead. Looking at multi-identity and at behaviours and ethics within it, collective collaborations, and actually at the future careers that are coming through in this world. As part of that um, programme, we commissioned several pieces, and this piece by Louis-Philippe de Mer is called The Blind Robot. And this piece has now gone all over the world because it got so much attention. It's actually a robot without a head that you sit in front of, and its arms reach out to you, and it just touches and feels your face all over and gets to know you in a familiar way. And actually, this, I think, is totally of its time, this piece. Louis-Philippe's very good at hitting the spot of actually the whole thing of human-machine interaction, of robotic touch to the body. Now, as we know, the uncanny valley is there, but it's a moving valley, yeah? This valley is moving on. Today, we know in Japan, there's about 20, 30 companies producing robots for the home, for domestic care. There are many more people in the world in hospitals, etc., and we will all be cared for by robots. So the whole thing of robotic touch of ourselves is a moving a moving scary thing, but coming into play. Additionally, when we did some research with Nesta, who do Future Fest, about young people and robots, 26% of young people in the UK, out of quite a big group actually, said they would happily date a robot. And actually, provided their Android bow looked just like a real life human being. But as you all know, and I haven't got pictures here, the robotic world is very much going towards the real looking robots, skin developments, um, the development of a sex robot is the biggest one, of course. So there we are in that touch intimacy world again. Avatars equally, this is our collective avatar called All Array, who you actually saw the earlier version of um, previously. And All has been, comes out for various projects, whether they're installations or live performance projects, she's kind of part of the group. And additionally, when I was talking to students um, last year, one of them came up with, well, in the future when I find somebody I want to have a date with, she or he might be in Tokyo, but for our first date, she or he would, would, could come to my house as a hologram and have a drink with me. So that idea of like Tinder in the future moves on massively into the representation of the body and the self. So having a, a date at your home with a hologram, then finding out actually if you want to physically meet. So back to the hypersensory self and how far we've got on this today. Now we know from actually even from fitness bands that a lot of this data is coming from our bodies and how we can use that. But in fact, what I want to do is to take us back to what really liveness is and how we actually really look at the essence of liveness. Performing arts, you get taught very clearly about what liveness is when you're performing on stage. And so presence or absence is very much part of it. And we know that we have the physicality, the breath, the immediacy, the eye contact that we have in this room now, the intimacy and involvement and interaction that can happen. Equally, we have memory coming from it, and memory in group, um, you know, between two of you or more as such, particularly in intimate situations. Now, liveness is always on. It's not something we turn off, like our Fitbit or our phone. We breathe at night, our heart continues to beat. It's part of our being. We are human through our liveness, as are many other things. And it's a sensory richness, where you're both participating, but you're also spectating. So the essence of experiential liveness, actually, is about allowing us to focus on that, is about the real connection between humans. The connection that's based in emotions, the connection that's based in involvement and in belonging, and that is the being human bit. So what we're still working on, and we're nowhere near it yet, and I think we still have a lot to see happen, both in the pioneer scene and in 
the arts in creative tech, etc., which is, I think, the exciting bit about the next decade, is actually that quality connectivity that can happen through virtual, physical, blended experiences. And we know that that's coming through in AR, in mixed realities, and a lot of development starting to happen as tools start to converge. Some earlier examples of this and later ones. I mean, there's the Fitbit. I was mentioning Jawbone, this one is, which is tracking us. And the Apple Watch, that's an old version of it. But we know a lot of people are using their Apple Watches, which is following through their, every bit of their lives. But also um, Imogen Heap, who actually has created these Moo Moo gloves with her, her um, group, where these amazing gloves where they can actually shift sound around themselves, create music on the spot. I saw her before we were on a panel together last week. Absolutely fantastic work, actually. Um, you know, the orchestra is here, the drums are here, the big bass drum is here. She's dynamic there. She can sample herself through microphones on her wrist. Really wonderful, these Moo Moo gloves. And they're going out and about. You'll see several, I think there's about 200 people working with them now. But actually here at the bottom, it's good to remember that the first glove, Lady Glove, was actually 1991 as part of Arts Electronica. So we see these developments coming through from early pioneers right through. Another one to mention, of course, is Steve Mann. And Steve Mann's work with the um, glasses that he wore from the early 90s has been acknowledged by Google as a complete pioneer line up to the Google Glass and the development of VR. He's at University of Toronto, still doing really good stuff. This is an artist called um, Marco Donnarumma, and he's um, been part of a group that have created this um, one of the many actual gen gestural um, wrist or arm, or they put it all over their bodies, on their legs, etc. Um, and this one, which is the picture in the red, the Be a Biocreative, is a small white sensor, and it reads his muscles. It reads his muscles, the sound of his muscles moving, the sound of the blood going through his veins, his heartbeat, his breath, and several other factors are taken by that sensor on the arm, on the leg, and he uses that to do incredibly beautiful um, performances with audio and visual. Um, equally, this, this product is going out into creative industries, it's going into the marketplace, and it can be used for drawing on to um, interactive boards and projections, it can be used for gaming, it can be used to move data around yourself within large-scale immersion spaces. So we're seeing the biofeedback move directly into the useful every day for education, for workplace, etc. And that means that our bodies start to be at the centre of all this interaction. Another very beautiful piece by the unseen, Lauren Bauker. And this is, she calls herself a material alchemist. She's coming from a chemistry background and she's making wonderful fashion um, items which actually change colour linked to user interaction or the environment that they're in. And actually, these are luxury items at the moment. These will obviously ultimately come through to us. They are in small ways, we see them. But they change linked to air pressure, to body temperature, to touch, to wind, to sunlight. And she's one example of many people in the fashion tech world who are starting to work with the influence of the body, the biofeedback of the body, and outside environmental data is coming to it, the mix of these things. And one of my favourite pieces, which is a piece by Umbrellium, which is um, uh, Usman Hack and Andrew Chetty, based in London too. This is a laser piece, which is actually, you go into those lasers and you touch them and you move them around you. You can twirl them around you, you can make patterns with them, you can draw them around you like cloaks. It's the closest I've ever been to a kind of teleporting scenario. I did a lot of work in this as a user tester. And um, this piece is on tour. It's part of an exhibition called Digital Revolution. So if you get a chance to go in, play in it for a good amount of time if you can. Now, one of the reasons I'm showing these is because I think the gesture area, we are just starting to actually work with. Now, gestures are part of our natural body. We actually gesture a lot as humans. We know we do. We don't always even consciously notice it. I gesture when I'm talking. If I was talking directly with Carmen or some people gesture more than others, some cultures gesture more than others. But actually, this is very important to take into place, that many people work with gestures. If you think about referees in the sports field, Obviously, dance and mime use gestural languages, but equally health and safety when there's emergency scenarios. All those firemen and those ambulance people are working through gestures across the emergency sites together. They have completely clear gesture languages. And we know, of course, about deaf sign languages, of which there are 
probably about 10 or 12 around the world. There isn't even one, yeah. And we also, in gaming, which is just below the city, is um, the emerging emotion signifiers through gesture-based interfaces into the gaming world too. Now, I think we're underestimating gestures at the moment, even though we have gesture tech very clearly coming through on the agenda. Gestures mean that we do not have to have things attached to our bodies, that we can do with our natural selves exactly how we've been evolved, yeah? actually interact with the data and the information we want to pull to us or push away from us. The data from our body, leaving our body, has been changed into other data to come back to us through gestures. So imagine, for example, if you wake up in the morning and the alarm's going, you want to snooze, you just do a gesture. You want the shower to go on and get warm, you do it in advance. You want the shower to be hotter, you want the shower to be colder. You want the heating to go on, you could do shivering. There's a lot of gesture interfaces that we could start to have. And also, I think we will start to see the development of far more gesture languages in the world as it allows us to be natural in those data environments. Now, gesture is a big part of love and intimacy, and that's including touch, of course. So if we look at our special relationships, whether they're with family, with friends, but in particular with our lovers and partners, whether we're together and in the future more and more at a distance, gesture and touch are part of this. And this is why we think that we've got to try and get this into the middle of this collaborative share space. How do we actually start to look at the collaborative share space as more of a place of compassion and of pleasure, of intimacy and love, rather than at the moment, probably, you know, if we look at gaming, 70, 80% of it being about killing rather than loving, which is the irony of the whole scenario. So um, how do we start to be in that space as virtual physical bodies and how do we start to use it to actually create joy and compassion in the world? How do we look at eroticism? How do we look at rapture? How do we start to cherish each other and have tenderness and affection as the key things that are coming through this, this connected world that we're part of? So now, I'd just like to put a few future ideas to you which relate to my concept of the Internet of Bodies being much more important than the Internet of Things, yeah? The Internet of Things can link to us through our bodies fine, but actually, here we are. We can look at implants. Implants control the data around you, and I'm going to show you a few slides about implant use actually in the body. There's several universities in the world very exploring this a lot, but in Britain, one of the key people that's been a pioneer in this area is Professor Kevin Warwick, and him and his partner are actually connected through the brain gate Utah ray of electroid implants. Here they are, um, and they actually have them inside their bodies. They're connected together and to their computer system, both in working together, actually, but also to their home. Um, and they've done masses of experiments with implants. They now know exactly what, what metals we can use, platinum, iridium, silicon, gold, and they're tiny grain of rice size, really tiny little implants that can be put in most parts of the body. In general, they're put into the hand or the arm at the moment, you can do many things with these. You can feel how far away objects are at a distance. You can feel heat from a distance. But of course, the most useful for our everyday lives at the moment is actually the touch identity scenarios that we do or the objects that we have to use to open and close things, your key fob, your phone pin number, etc. At FutureFest this year, where I was the curator for the Future Love side of it, and that's all on the web, there's a load of Future Love stuff on the web there, we did an implant party. So on stage, we had um, a, a, a proper tattooist piercer who has a license to do implants, and he implanted actually the director of Nesta, who's very brave, and the director of Futures at Nesta, with these tiny grain of rice implants into this part of the hand, just right here between the thumb and the fingers. And I think one of them chose to open his phone with it, very simple, another one to open the laptop. And this was very, very quick for them to do. If you think about it, you can replace a lot of things in your bag or pocket. You know, your Easter card, your credit card, your keys, your actual access to many things can be replaced by a hand gesture. And implants are the way it's going. Now, this isn't just a one-off I'm talking about. Implant parties are happening all over the world. In fact, there's queues at some of the implant parties that are happening, and young people are going for it, yeah? And I think one of the things I will say is that, you know, 
it's not long before the 18th birthday present is not the next smartphone. It's actually, I want my implant, Dad. Yeah. And that is not far off because for younger generations, these types of things are not at all worrying. They're on top of it. And I can testify that from doing a lot of focus groups around this work. If we look back in time, and this is the famous cyborg handbook by Donna Haraway, she foresaw many of these uses of implants and the use of them linked to technology. Now today in medical terms, of course, we do have many implants from very simple ones like our teeth and um, heart pacemakers, but to very complex ones like deep brain simulation for Parkinson's disease and motor neuron disease patients. And I think there's over 200 medical implants now in use regularly into our bodies for health terms. So implants are on their way. And here's Stellark, because I had to, had to actually mention Stellark. Again, an advanced implant person and a body tech cyborg on the edge of cyborg. He, as you know now, has the ear on his arm and is working towards having the implant in his ear on his arm, which will allow him to use that as his telephone and as his voice and connector out to the world. I'm coming from the dance world. I do a lot of work into the dance sector. This is actually a piece by artist um, Lesia Turbat. And this I showed to a group of um, uh, the Associated Ballet, Ballet Dancers of Italy for a big conference. Talked to them about implants, showing them this product, which actually is obviously sensors attached to the, to the ankle and to the, sh the shoe and said, in the future, this could be just an implant in your big toe, who actually would go for that. And thinking, you know, I was in quite the straighter, much straighter scene of the ballet world, wasn't expecting a lot of feedback on that, expecting a bit of a rejection. Literally every hand in the room went up. And this is because for them, their toe, and what they do with their toe, and their spatial aspecting, because as dancers, we have to learn that in our heads, our spatiality and what we're doing on a stage is so important for rehearsal, for reconstruction of those works and for their knowledge about their work on stage, they would just go for it like that. So that was quite special. Another area which is in fast development is smart skin and smart skin circuits and the peripheral nervous systems which are starting to interface with technologies. Now, these have been woven into materials, but actually I'm more interested in the patches that go onto skin and the stretchy electronics that you can stick on yourself. But they're also coming into implants and, and just under the skin and tattoos. So if you've got a circuitry on your arm, actually what can you do with gesture with that? What can you do without any, anything on your body which is weighing you down, which is stopping you being able to be your natural self, to move in your natural way, to be human? just to be human and for the data and the digital world to work for us and around us. So this is replication of a sense of touch. Obviously, these are automatically being used in medical terms straight away. Diabetics are using them. Sun exposure is one of the things that's been used for. But I think we'll see these go a lot further in terms of their interfacing. One of the areas of smart skin development is in robotics. And this is particularly for human robots and very advanced, obviously, in the sex robot scene. And we've all seen the eerily beautiful, mainly female robots with his wonderful skins on them. The other area in robotics, which is developing fast, is programmable chemical gels and DNA nanobots. Now, these go right into our bodies. Now, these gels are actually being created to help robot joints. They're actually to enable robots to start to move more fluidly and more human-like. But these are equally usable, and as are nanobots into the bloodstream, to actually program us, to create us into a more mixed human-machine human scenario. They use complex signaling processes, and they're using DNA algorithms, basically, and they use the sensing, computing, and actuating, and the therapeutic systems at the moment. Now, these are not in the human body yet, but they're definitely coming our way. So here we are. There's us human in the middle of this, and actually, over the last few years, I think we've seen a lot of movement towards the avatar side. We've all got avatars. We were talking about that this morning. And connectivity and interactivity, the co-relativity, and that multi-identity to our multi-avatars, many of us, yeah, has developed massively in the last 10 years, as we saw with Second Life today, as with many other things. The cyborg development has been a bit slower. So I've been talking very much about from the wearable to the robotic and the pr prosthesis, implants, and, of course, AI coming as well. So there we go towards the cyborg. 
Now, what of these are we going to be? A complete mixture of this whole thing. So this is future questions. I don't have those answers. These are the next decade's questions. And actually, for each of us individually, these are very, very subjective choices. They're very much about what you would feel about those things. So this is my Internet of Bodies, a collaborative share space where implants, smart skin, nanorobots, DNA gels, plus 360 degree immersion if we can, and gestural interactions come together where we don't have wires, where we're not tied down by wires or wearables, no attachments of any type, and we can be our natural selves. And in that space, we can start to experience the intimacy of two, three, four bodies together, the touch, the physicality that is actually part of our, our love and future love. So just to wrap up, we're very clear, and I know this group knows, we're in a very expanding ecosystem. And all of these things are not yet understood, particularly the big data side of it, the amount of data coming from each of us. Not understood by any of us in this room, but even by the most radical innovators or by big business. It is like, what the heck are we going to do? Where is all this going? What's happening? It's new learning for all of us, but what we do know is these are highly complex patterns of interaction between creative makers and creative users. And as our physical and virtual worlds do blend and merge, we're shifting our identities, and our identities are naturally hyper-enhanced. They naturally can become more sensory. Our partnerships can be based in immersive environments and connected environments, and our relationships, therefore, can be far more diverse and far more inclusive as we expand beyond the closer communities of physicality that we're caught in. But how can we ensure the ethical use of our personal data? That is a big question. And that big question is right on the table at the moment. So it's hitting into all the corporates, it's hitting into all the public bodies, into the city halls of all types. And it's well worth looking out in each of your countries where those questions are being asked. Um, there's some big EU projects, one called Decode, which is looking at this with Amsterdam, Barcelona, London, but I think several other countries involved too. Should we own our own data? I believe we should. I'm a person that believes we should have a personal donor card for our data, just like I do in my purse for my organs, and I believe that can be an implant in my arm. And that I can control that data, where I want it to go, who I want to share it with, who I give it to anonymously for research, who I give it to because I want to share it with them for free, who I actually charge for the use of my data. <coughs> But most importantly, how do we collaborate to enable all these future things to happen? And one of the key things is diversity and inclusivity in this area. We do need to come together. We need to work together with processes and expertise and investment. It is very difficult to do this work at a high sophistication level without the investment attached to it. So we need to work with creative industries and with business, if we can, to enable these things to happen because we need quality creation to happen and good content to start to come out. And it's a dissemination of that that is very important, of the virtual physical blended experience. So it is actually goes beyond just being caught in a white Western world of precious people who can actually have these experiences so much more than others. Um, and that human sensory experience, to love rather than kill, we know that is so needed, that message in today's world. So let's look for quality visual physical share space to widen our visions and try to enable a diversity of content. In this future love area, for example, there is probably 70% of any virtual reality uh, material, if not more, and I'm probably being very good here saying that, um, which is to do with love and sex, is actually just directly transposed from white male heterosexual porn into virtual reality. So it's very little for anyone who is not a white male heterosexual. There's very little still for the lesbian, gay, and queer community. There's very little for people with very different tastes from different cultures, from different backgrounds. There's very little for women and made by women. Yeah, 52% of the world are still not getting their actual input on that. So that diversity and inclusivity is really important because as I said before, you can't just observe this space, you need to participate. And that actually is the experience itself. So how do we enable that participation to a wider group of people? So our bodies are moving through these ever-deepening layers and interwoven, non-linear routes, multi-choice, very fluid pathways, very individual to each of us in this room. And our digital selves 
exist naturally alongside our physical selves in this future, future world. We have mega data flows extending from us, coming back to us, all around us. And that's how we can co-create together the Internet of Bodies. Thank you. I guess I should do any questions because Carmen's just had to leave a room for a minute. So, are there any questions or comments? Who actually here, then, I'll do one. Who in this room would not have any problem about having an implant? One, two, yeah? Could you, yeah, maybe. Anyone else? Three, yeah. So who has got a reason really very clearly why they wouldn't do that? I can put the mic out. Yeah? Oh, good, great. I'm not sure if, oh, yeah, it's on. Um, just because I was upstairs reading book just before I came downstairs for the speech so that would be my main question actually regarding the implants and the speech is have any of your performances ever been hacked already or the projects that you have worked on because I assume that would be the next step if right so we're not working with implants yet so actually this is I was talking future from that section into talk maybe you came in a bit late for that yes so I was actually talking about the future. I was talking about there are a lot of people who are having mm -hmm. implants, yeah, but I haven't got any yet, yeah, and actually I'm not working with dancers who have yet, so, but yes, that is the, the issue, and it's why I brought up the personal data thing, yes, yeah. I was just wondering, actually, I, I did see the whole speech. Right. It's Sorry. just the, the actual dance performances that were happening before, oh. if any of those were ever... Uh, interfered with. I was just curious because it was all over the world and you had it going on. It was m certainly publicized and it would have been probably That's a tempting. Good question. Um, not thinking about, I haven't, I haven't thought about this well, not, not negatively, but we did do work um, in around 2000, 2001 at Arizona State University where we had um, lights and cameras which were movable by people who were on the web. Yeah. And that was. At that point, it was like, whoa, you know, we, anyone on the web can move the lights while we're performing and can move the cameras to different points. But actually, ultimately, it was a real pain in the ass because, of course, you were suddenly in the middle of something and a light would go off or you, were, you would finish the sessions and, the, the, you know, all starting to change, etc. and suddenly the camera would start working. So, yes, there's interference to a certain extent. There is an example of um, hacking that happened for the exhibition Digital Revolution in London for the actual Google um, commission room. Um, to do is um, upsets around Google. There was a whole hacking setup that happened by artists into that. So yes, we know there are activism scenarios of that type, yeah. Um, I'm very curious about the, um, uh, you showed the person who, who were wearing the VR glasses for 27 days, and uh, I was, I'm curious, uh, do you know any feedbacks? Uh, how has the project going on, and uh, um, what, what's the result of that? <laughs> yeah, no, actually, I do know quite a lot, because I work uh, quite closely on it, and um, Mark is, at the moment, it's at a point of um, the creation of the VR headset to be light enough to be um, they're actually changing lenses to deal with his eyes because of the issue of being in the eye scenario for so long. Also, he's working with um, a psychologist therapist to actually help him to deal with the experience itself and to build up the knowledge so that they can evaluate it beyond it. Yeah. Um, there's a whole set of testing that will be done in about two months' time. The project's meant to take place, I think, in February next year. So, yes, I have to keep an eye on it, yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else people wanted to ask or comment on? What about for you? You said you would definitely have an implant, yeah. What kind of implant would you go for? And I, 
I don't know. I think it's it would be really easy if I had my whole identity into a digital format in my body. Of course, um, with some cryptographic behind it, like blockchain or something, it has to be secured very much. But yes. So I'm kind of with you. I feel. I feel like it. Like my personal data is mine. I'd like to quite have it with within me. I don't know. What do people feel about the personal data scenario in relationship to the issue that at the moment we don't own our data, but actually we, it's given, you know, we give it out. Um, and say, for example, let's take Facebook. Yeah, we, most people in this room will have a Facebook account. That data doesn't belong to you. It belongs to Facebook. Um, we know it's been used for psychopolitical profiling. We know that with this, you know, for every political campaign out there, there's probably... 500 different adverts made for the same, with the same message but in different ways, which are chucked into each of us in the right way to suit our um, social political profiling. What do people feel should be happening on that area? Should we own our own data or are we okay because we don't pay Facebook for usage? Are there any comments on that? None? What do people feel about their personal data? Is it ours or is it theirs? Okay, so non-political audience. Just giving all your stuff away and you don't mind the corporates making money on it, yeah? So, okay, all right, well, thanks a lot, yeah. <laughs>